Good evening. Thank you so much for joining me, everyone. So today what we're doing is capital assets, property, plant, and equipment, intangibles, and goodwill are so important. If you look at financial statements such as pretty well any merchandiser, but such as Walmart or Amazon, you'll realize that their long-lived assets are unbelievably large in comparison to their other assets. So the valuation of these items, long-lived assets, property, plant, and equipment, intangibles, and goodwill is critical with regards to the assets on the financial statements. One of the most important aspects or mm, probably the most difficult aspects with regards to the valuation of long-lived assets is the fact that we don't have any external verification with regards to their valuation. It's so much easier when we're looking at inventory and we can look at the lower of cost and net realizable value. Or we can look at cash and we can do a bank reconciliation to get verification with regards to the valuation. Or we can look at accounts receivable and we do the allowance for doubtful accounts. But when it comes to long-lived assets, valuation is far more fluid. It really is an aspect of professional judgment with regards to management and how they are valuing the assets on the financial statements. So let's start by looking at them. Uh, you'll notice first we're going to go through the learner objectives. We're going to try and cover all of those with the questions. And so we're just going to start on the questions. What should be included in the cost of a long-lived asset? Both IFRS and ASPE state the same thing. The valuation of a long-lived asset is based on what we think is necessary to make it ready for use. So a company may spend um, money on a long-lived asset, but that doesn't mean it should be added to the valuation of a long-lived asset. Oh, sorry, asset. Um, the only thing that should be added is something that is necessary to make it ready for use. And I'm speaking specifically about the initial purchase of an asset. I'm not talking about post-acquisition costs. We have bought it, we've used it for a few years, and then we spend more money on it. I'm speaking specifically about what happens when we purchase it. Let's start by going through Q9-1. What we really want to decide is what is necessary to make this item that we're purchasing, we've got equipment, what is necessary to make it ready for use. And I want to be clear with regards to this. It doesn't mean that we actually have to start using it. It simply means that it's ready for use. And that's a very different definition. Also, if you're looking at the costs, whatever costs are reoccurring, it's unlikely that they're necessary to make it ready for use. Reoccurring costs are necessary to use it, but they're not necessary to make it ready for use. So an example would be purchasing a license for a car. You know, students sometimes say to me, well, legally you can't drive the car unless you have a license, but the license is not necessary to make it ready for use. It's necessary to use it but not to make it ready for use. You could drive a vehicle without having a license. It is illegal, but the vehicle itself is not aware of that. The vehicle itself doesn't require a license in order to work. So it's, you have to be a little bit careful with regards to the definition. All right, so remember, whenever we're looking at this, we want to say to ourselves, is it necessary to make that long-lived asset ready for use? And it is a matter of professional judgment. Not all accountants agree on what will be included. And as a consequence, we have differences between different companies. All right. So we've got Green Corporation and they purchase equipment on April 1st, 2016 um, for $50,000. And they also pay the following costs. But the, the initial invoice cost is $50,000. Definitely, we wouldn't even have a question of necessary to make it re ready for use if we did not have the equipment. So this is necessary. So we're going to do a debit to the equipment account and a credit to either cash or a liability. There's no indication, so I'm going to put both. That's $50,000. I now have a start to my equipment account. Here's my equipment account, which is, of course, an asset because it has future economic benefit, I'm going to put $50,000 in there. Next, $900 for freight charges. Necessary or not necessary? Exactly. Now keep in mind on an exam, I would probably ask you for an explanation as to why you think it's necessary. 
Anyone? I'm going to wait until you guys think about it. OK, you can't use it if it's not where it should be. Exactly. Moving equipment where it will be used, need to get it to where you will use it. Exactly. So notice, I don't want the same wording all the time. I sometimes see just lists of necessary to make it ready for use, necessary to make it ready for use. I, I'm not going to accept that. It doesn't mean I, I can actually understand why you're doing that. So keep in mind, you really have to support your position with reasoning and, and not necessarily using those exact words. So I agree. I absolutely. So let's assume that this is again on April 1st, 2016. So therefore, we're going to debit equipment and credit cash. Let's assume they paid cash, and that is $900. So notice all costs that are necessary to make it ready for use go into the equipment account. They do not get expensed. They do not go anywhere else. They go directly into the equipment co cost, and they end up becoming part of the original valuation or the acquisition cost of the item. All right, then we got $150 for insurance while the equipment was in transit. Yes. Could I say no? I think I could say no. I could argue that the insurance was a choice, but it wasn't necessary, and therefore I could expense the cost of the insurance during shipping. The shipping was definitely necessary, but I don't feel that the insurance was. Would that be an acceptable choice to expense the $150? And the answer would be yes. So don't forget, this is a matter of professional judgment. And you can support both positions. And as a consequence, both, posi both positions are actually correct. So as long as you support your position with reasoning, you're good to go. Now, that means sometimes you you know, if I said the, the shipping costs should be expensed because they're not necessary to make it ready for use, I don't really need to pay shipping in order to get the equipment, that would be false. And that clearly is a wrong answer. But when it comes to the insurance, that really was a choice. And you could go either way. I'm going to put it in with the cost of the equipment. I actually think that without the payment of insurance, um, it would have been problematic to get it here and make sure it would get here in one piece. So I'm going to state that it was necessary in order to bring the equipment here. But you could have argued the other way also. And you would have been right as long as you supported your position. So I'm going to do debit to equipment and a credit to cash. And that was $150. All right, so now we move on to uh, $1,900 for a one-year insurance policy. I agree. I don't think the insurance is necessary. So in that case, what entry will I make? Debit credit. Exactly. Prepaid insurance. It's not that this is not an asset. It is an asset. It's just a short-term short asset. Cash, $1,900, $1,900. Excellent. Now we have $1,500 to train employees to use the new equipment. I have to agree with Chelsea and Polly. This is a no. Now, how come? Because the machine could be, no, the machine is ready for use without training the employees. And the employees are not the machine. And employees come and go. Michaela, that's exactly it. I agree that if no one was trained, we couldn't use the machine. But this is the difference between ready for use and use. So in this case, we would expense it because the employees are not part of the machine. And your employee could leave the day after you train them. So it really has nothing to do with the machine. That has to do with your employees. So I'm going to to April 1st, 2016, I am going to do debit, and I'm going to use training expense and credit cash, 1,500, 1,500. And then you've got um, $3,400 for testing and installation. Absolutely. Without that testing and installation, the equipment would never be ready for use. So we have to add it in. So that's a debit to the equipment. Any credit to cash, $3,400. Oops, sorry about that, $3,400. Nothing, no other expenses, so we can add it up. That is $54,450. There is the original acquisition cost 
of the equipment. From this day forth, we will always assume that the equipment costs this much. And whenever we're looking for the original cost, that is now the original cost. We totally ignore the fact that the 50000 was by itself. Sometimes students do this very, very well. And then I ask them to calculate depreciation, and they go back to the 50000 Once we've done this, the acquisition cost becomes the total of all the costs we put into there. So we've got additional information here. The equipment was ready for use. So this was on all on April 1st. The equipment was ready for use on May 1st, but the company did not start using it until June 1st. Green estimates that the equipment will be used for four years, during which time they estimate that it will be used for 8,400 machine hours. At the end of four years, it's estimated that it will have a residual value of 18,450. And the company has a December 31st year end. So I want to talk about a few of these things. Green estimates that the equipment will be used for four years. Management at the company are the individuals who make a determination with regards to the estimated useful life. So keep in mind that it's not the auditors or the accountants from an external company that is making this decision. It's actually the management and the accountants within the company. And they need to base it on something that they believe to be true. Often that has to do with intention. I intend to keep this machine for the next 10 years. I'm going to use 10 years as the estimated useful life. That doesn't mean that I'm actually going to use it for 10 years, but at that time, I think I will. So management's intention is part of the uh, estimation of its useful life. Um, they also say, uh, at the end of the four years, it will be estimated to have a residual value of $18,450. That residual value assumes, I'm going to just, so we went through estimated useful life. So we're good with that. It's management based on intention. Um, we've now got the residual value. In order to determine a residual value, the item must be available on a secondary market an active secondary market. Now, an active secondary market means that there is a market for these used products. And why do we need an active secondary market in order to come up with a residual value? That's because we're asking, what is the value of this item when I sell it at the end of four years? Oh, I should mention also, estimated useful life does not necessarily mean total life. So for instance, I may have a car and I'm planning to use it for seven years, but my car may last 15 to 20 years. So estimated useful life is how long the company thinks they're going to use it, not how long it will last in total. Residual value is the amount that the company thinks they can sell it for at the end of its estimated useful life. If we don't have an active secondary market for used goods, we wouldn't be able to determine the residual value. In fact, with long-lived assets that do not have an active secondary market, the residual value must be made zero because we actually have no support for a position to say that we know what the residual value is. But if I buy, let's say I buy a car, and I say to myself, it's a Toyota Corolla, and I'm going to drive it seven years, I could look up on Kijiji and any number of other sites, Auto Trader, and I could find out what a seven-year-old Toyota Corolla is selling for. And I could use that as an estimation for its estimated useful life. If there is no secondary market, estimated useful life is zero, because otherwise, you would overstate your assets. So now, let's go over to part B on the second page. When should the company begin to depreciate the equipment? We have three dates. We have April 1st, which is when we bought it, May 1st, when it's ready for use, and June 1st, when we actually begin to use it. Thoughts? May 1st. June. We've got two votes. Anyone else? April 1st, May. So it turns out that we are required to start depreciating it as soon as it is ready for use. If it's not ready for use yet, we don't have to depreciate it at that time. And we do not wait until it's actually in use. And that's because depreciation and amortization represent use and obsolescence. I think I just put that wrong. Oh my goodness. 
obsolescence. Okay, you guys know how to spell it. <laughs> Sorry about that. So it represents use and obsoles obsolescence. So therefore, the moment it is ready for use, we have to start depreciating it. Or if it's an intangible, amortizing it. We don't wait until we start using it. And you have to think, a good example would be a food truck, right? It might be that the food truck is only used in the summertime. And during the wintertime, it's put away in storage. Let's say you, you get your food truck finished on, on you know, October 12th, and you're not going to use it for the wintertime. But as it is in storage, it is becoming obsolete. Right? It's becoming older, and its value is reducing. So depreciation and amortization, they recognize both of those things. moment it is ready for use, we have to start amortizing. All right. So now, next, which depreciation method would you recommend, and why? So we've got straight line. We've got d diminishing balance, also called declining balance. And we've got units of production, also called units of activity. So actually, we have to pick a method that will match expense to the revenue it helps to generate. So if this piece of equipment tends to generate revenue equally over its lifespan, then this is revenue. Then we would choose to use straight line depreciation to recognize depreciation expense, because we want to match the expense to the revenue it helps to generate. If the piece of equipment initially generates high revenue and then the revenue starts to decline as the equipment ages, well, then we would use diminishing balance. This is the revenue line, right? So we've got revenue here, and this is the depreciation expense. So if we expect it to be high at the beginning of its life, and then it starts breaking down a lot, and it doesn't run as efficiently as it did before, so as it goes through time, we generate less revenue, then we're going to use diminishing balance. If the activity tends to change over time, so it'll generate a lot of revenue, and then a little bit and a lot, a, a, a food truck would be a good example, right? If we're not on the road and we're not going to places, then the food truck isn't making very much revenue. So the depreciation expense should match this. So here's our revenue, and here's our depreciation expense. Now, units of production, also called units of activity, do need a unit measure. Can we use units of production for a building? Absolutely not because there is no measure of use. I mean, what, how many times they open or close the door? A, a chair, there's no measure of use. How many times somebody has sat in it? It just doesn't have a measure. For a unit of measure to work, we need something such as machine hours or kilometers or man hours, how long it's actually being run by an individual. Um, we can use the number of, of products that it actually produces. So if it's, a, if it's a molding machine, it might be good for 3 million molds. Well, in that case, we have a unit to measure its use, and then we can use units of production. But you can see we have to make a choice. Now, we're not going to make a choice in this instance. We are actually going to demonstrate all three methods. But keep in mind that companies would have to make a choice. They would have to decide straight line diminishing balance or units of production. And once they've made that choice, it's general that you keep that choice. There are rules that allow us to change it, but they're pretty extensive, and you have to explain why you're doing it. So we want to calculate straight line, diminishing balance, and uh, units of activity. So let's start with straight line. Straight line has a formula that we can apply. It is the original cost. And when I say original, I mean the 54,450. Right? That's our new original cost. We're never going to think of the 50000 by itself ever again. Um, we take away the residual value. And here, the residual value was 18450 divided by the estimated useful life in years. So in this case, we've got 4. And then we multiply it times the number of months in use 
divided by 12 months. Now, you always want to think about the number of months in use because if, for instance, in this case, remember we said that we would start depreciating at May 1st. Well, May 1st is not a whole year, so I can't take a whole year's depreciation. When I divide it by four years, I'm going to get a whole year's depreciation, but I can't depreciate for a year because I've only used it from May. So in this case, number of months in use would be eight. All right, what is the depreciation we will record in the first year? $6,000. Absolutely. So we've got here a depreciation chart, which I always like to do. I think it's important to do a depreciation chart, uh, accumulated depreciation. And we've got the carrying value. It's also called the book value, but with IFRS, we've really decided to call it a carrying value. We're going to take, we're going to assume we take depreciation. This is an adjusting entry. We know this is an adjusting entry because of Chapter 4. Let's just review Chapter 4. What type of adjusting entry is it? Cast your mind back to Chapter 4. We've got an accrued. It's got to be one. It's got to be an either an accrued expense or accrued revenue. Accrued expense. Do we have agreement on this? You know it's always a bad thing when I say that, right? It's definitely not an accrued expense. An accrued expense, think about it. If you want to bring something to mind when you say the word accrued, think of wages. That would be a debit to wages expense? Yes, it is. Which type of prepayment? Because there's two types. So if you're thinking accrual expense, think about wages, debit to wages expense, credit to wages payable. An accrued expense must have a payable in it. And this does not have a payable. It's a prepayment. It's a prepaid expense. Right? Also called into deferred expense. We defer recognizing the expense until we use it. So that's a, a real tip. Um, okay, so we've got December 31st, and we purchased it in 2000 and, my apologies for flipping pages, 2016. The depreciation expense we've already determined is $6,000. Accumulated depreciation is always the accumulated depreciation from the previous period, and then add in the current depreciation expense, together $6,000. Carrying value is always the original cost minus the accumulated depreciation. So in this case, what would this be? Exactly. So we have to go back and use the 54450 minus the $6,000. And that is $48,450. Once we do this calculation for $6,000, we're going to do the entry. So what is the entry? December 31st, 2016. Debit credit. Debit depreciation expense, absolutely. For the $6,000. And credit, accumulated depreciation. $6,000. If we were now to show it on the statement of financial position, because I think it's important to think about that, we would put down property, plants, and equipment as a heading. And we would have equipment here. The equipment would be 54450 Then we would say less accumulated depreciation. And that would be the $6,000. And then the carrying value would go underneath there. And we agreed that was 48450 So that's what would show up on the Statement of Financial Position at December 31st, 2016. Let's go back here. So now we're going to fast forward. We are sitting at December 31st, 2017. What is the amount of our depreciation expense? Nine thousand. Absolutely, because the original cost minus the residual value divided by four multiplied by 12 over 12. Here we used it eight months, but here we're going to use it 12 months. So this would be nine thousand dollars. We're going to take this. Oops. We're going to take the 6,000, add in the 9,000, and that is equal to 15,000. And then we're going to take the 54,450, and we're going to subtract the 15,000, which is equal to uh, 6,000. Oh, yes, you put down 6,000. No, it's got to be 12 over 12. 
So remember, this works, this uh, number of months in use divided by 12, it works no matter what. Oh, thank you, 39,450. Okay, we would do an entry, December 31st. I'm not going to redo the entry because the entry is always the same. Then we would do the statement of financial position, and you would see that the carrying value will go down to the new carrying value, right? Accumulated depreciation will go up, and this will go down. So we might as well fast forward to December 31st, 2018. We've got 12 months going on here. It would be 9,000. We're going to do the plus. This is 24,000. And then this is going to be uh, 39,000. It's going to be 30,450, which is the 54,450 minus the 15,000. We would do the entry. We'd do our financial statements. We would move on to December 31st, 2019. 12 months, $9,000. We're going to go to do, 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 and this is 33000 and this would be 21450 which is a 54450 minus the 33. Did I just say 15000 here? I should have said 24000 and none of you corrected me. Uh, 33000 all right, we've got one, two, three, four years. We're good to go? You're right. It's not fiscal years that we're looking for for four years. Exactly. We started in May. So therefore, the last time we're going to take it. Now, I'm, I'm not going to put down uh, December 31st because the entry wouldn't be done at December 31st. It would be at the time that the life of this asset disappears, which would have been, we started in May 1st, so this would be April 30th, 2019, which will be the additional months that it takes to come up to another 12. Remember, we did eight originally, so this is going to be four. Now, if we add it together, it's four years. Previous to that, oh, 2020. Thank you for that catch. So now, how much depreciation am I going to take? Well, we can calculate it, right? We're going to multiply it times 4 over 12, $3,000. We're going to add in the $3,000 here. It's going to be 36000 And what do you think the carrying value will be? Equal to the residual value. 18,450, which is always equal to the residual value. We never depreciate the residual value, residual value, because it has future economic benefits. So it must remain on the financial statements as an asset. Excellent. I do want to point out just a little bit, a, little, a few things. Please don't forget about partial years, because when you forget about partial years, your whole schedule is incorrect. Is it the least accurate method? Ooh, Michaela, you use the word that I just never allow students to use. And that's the word accurate. This is an estimate based on an estimated useful life, an estimated residual value. We're guessing that this is how we're using this up. We are trying to match, let's go back for a second. Our purpose, of course, is to match the expense to the revenue it helps to generate. But it is a very imperfect match. There is no accurate method for depreciation. Not even units of activity, also called units of production, is accurate. Because I estimate how much I'm going to use it over the life of the asset. And that also is a guess. And then I guess the residual value. So there is no accurate method. There are there are accountants who swear that units of activity is the most accurate method there is, but I might guess that I'm going to drive my car 20,000 kilometers every single year for the next seven years, but that doesn't mean I drive my car for 20,000 kilometers over the next seven years. So there is no accurate method, and I don't think the word accurate can go along with the word estimate. It's a personal opinion, but be careful about using the word accurate on one of my exams, because I'm probably going to ding you. Because I truly believe that when we're estimating something, there is no such thing as accuracy. It's really just a big guess. Exactly. Exactly. And the fact is, we could say that we're going to keep it four years, and then three years from now or two years from now, we say, you know what? It's, 
it's just breaking down all the time, I'm going to get rid of it. Or four years from now, I say, wow, it's working really, really well. I'm going to keep it for an additional four years. We actually don't know how long. We can guess, but we really don't know. I know this to be true because the car I'm driving right now, I really didn't think I was going to be driving it this long, and I'm still driving it. All right. So let's move on to the next method. There we go. All right, so double diminishing balance. There's a formula for that, too. The first thing we have, oh, excuse me. The first thing we have to do is calculate the rate. The rate is equal to 1 divided by the estimated useful life multiplied times the factor. The factor will de depend on whether I'm using double declining balance, single declining balance, triple declining balance, quadruple declining balance. The company decides how fast they think this equipment is going to become uh, not useful anymore to producing revenue. So in this case, the most common is double declining, so I'm going to multiply it times 2. Don't forget, our estimated useful life is 4 years. Multiply it times 2, so my rate is? Exactly, 50%. Now keep in mind, this is based on management's estimates. So now I can do my chart. I've got my date, December 31st, 2016. I've got my carrying value at the beginning of the year. Well, my carrying value right now is 54,450. Notice something interesting. What did we not do here? What did we not do here? Reduce the residual value. That's because in this method, we do not take away the residual value. Instead, we save the residual value at the end. And I'm going to demonstrate that. So there's the carrying value. Now we've got our rate, and our rate is 50%. We've got our depreciation expense. Accumulated depreciation and then the carrying value at the end of the year, which we're going to put on the financial statements. Excellent. What's my depreciation expense? 18150 Well, that doesn't sound like 50% of 54450 27225 Polly, why do you think it's 18150 Because of the partial year. Exactly. We can't forget that we started using this, yeah, and that is very common. This is one of the most common errors on the final exam that I see, that students take the full year in the first year because they forget that we can only depreciate for the number of months in use. So actually, in this case, I've got to multiply this by 8 over 12. And I'm, I'm pretty certain, is that, did everybody else get 18,150? Okay, so we got 18,150. Of course, accumulated depreciation in the previous year was zero, so we're going to add in, and that's going to get us 18,150. And the carrying value is going to be at 54,450 minus the 18,150, which is equal to 36,300. So we take this 36,300 and we move it down. Oh, December 31st, 2016, we're going to do an entry. The entry would be this. So the entry with our method of depreciation does not change. The only thing that would happen is this time, instead of doing 6,000, like I did with straight line, I would do the 18,150. Sorry, I'm not going to repeat the entry over and over again. Just know that we would do an entry at December 31st. So now we're at December 31st, 2017. We carry down the carrying value, 36,300. Our rate is 50%, and our period is 12 over 12. So how much depreciation shall we take? Exactly. I know. It was just total fluke that it happened to be 18,150 again. Just heads up, guys. So can I take 18,000? So let's do 18,150. Then our accumulated depreciation is equal to that times 2, which, of course, is 36,300. And then if we subtract that from a 54, 450, we get 18,150. Agreed? Can we do this? Philip, you're correct. And Chelsea, we cannot. We are not permitted because it's below the residual value. And in the diminishing balance, we have to save the residual value. So 
in the year that it goes, the low the residual value, it does not matter what year it is. So you'll notice we're only in the second year and already it's below residual value. That's because of the method we're using for depreciation. We felt that it was very rapidly going to diminish in value both because of use and because of obsolescence. So in the year that it goes below, we work backwards. We say, no, we can't choose the 50%. Instead, we put the residual value in here, and we work backwards to determine the amount that we're going to be allowed to take. So 54,450 minus 18,450 is equal to 36,000. Oh, thank you, 36,000. And so this is going to be, what is it, 17,850? Is it 17,850? Let me just double check. Minus, yes, 17,850. So this is the amount that we're going to take. We cannot go below residual value. And that, again, is one of the problems that I see on the final exam. Um, I'll give you, you know, I'll ask you for three years of, of depreciation, and, and yeah, there we go. Students continue on, and they do the 50%, and the number keeps going down, and we forget that the residual value, in the moment that it goes below residual value, we must stop, work backwards, and not take depreciation anymore. So in this case, we would have the 18,450, our rate would be nothing, our depreciation expense would be zero, and we would have 18,450 right here. Oh, do, 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 oh my goodness, we would have 36,000 right here, and we would continue to have 18,450 here. So we would just keep going down. And sometimes, by the way, um, you'll go through the whole number of years, and you won't even reach the residual value, and you'll have to do See, we reduce the amount of depreciation expense, right? We went from 18,150 to 17,850. But sometimes I'll get to the end of my years and my depreciation is too low and I have to bump it up, right? So it's not a formula or anything like that. The only way you can tell is to do the chart. So now we have units of activity, like I said, also called units of production. So this one does have a formula. So we're looking to find out the depreciation per unit. So I'm going to do the original value, which we know is 54,450. I'm going to subtract the residual value, which in this case is 18,450. I'm going to divide it by the estimated units. for their whole life. So in this case, it said that the estimated units was, wait, I'm trying to find it on the original page, um, 8,400. Oh no, I, it wasn't units, it was machine hours. Just let me double check that it was machine hours. I'm pretty sure it was. It was machine hours, because that's the units we're using. So in that case, how much depreciation are we going to take per machine hour? 4.28 per machine hour. So now we've got the depreciation expense per machine hour, but we have to do a chart. Date, units, and this is actual. So note that even though I give you, oh, we've got 4.29, is it 4.28 or 4.29 rounded? Okay, so 29. We're still going to have a rounding error. There's always a rounding error when we're doing this, but it's not a problem. Yeah, it's 29. Um, so units is actual. So keep in mind that we would not be able to calculate the depreciation until the end of the period when we knew the actual units. This is one of the things with units of production or units of activity. You cannot start the chart and complete it. When we, were, when we do this one, we can start and complete the chart on the day that we bought the asset. And when we're doing straight line, it's the same kind of thing. We can start and complete the whole chart on the day we buy the asset. But when you're talking about units of activity, it is not possible to complete the chart in advance because you don't know the actual units until the end of the period. So now we've got our rate per unit. 
Then we've got our depreciation expense, accumulated depreciation, and the carrying value, which will show up on the statement of financial position. We're at December 31st, 2016. The number of units, we're given that information, 1,400. We've got the rate of 4.29. And so this is equal to, multiply, 6006. Do we have to multiply this times the number of months in use? No, we do not, because the units already take into account the number of months in use. So we never have to do that. That's another thing that I sometimes see on the exam. So I want to make sure that I address it. So of course, if we're looking at the carrying value of 54450 minus 6006 is equal to 48444. Now, at December 31st, 2017, we would have to look to see what is our usage before we could go any further. 2,100. Yes, 2,100. Thank you, Andrew. Um, multiplied times 4.29, which is equal to what? Um, this is 15,0015. No, 15. I got too many zeros. 015. Just one second, calculating the um, 54450 is equal to 39,435. And then we're going to continue December 31st, 2018. In this case, it is 2300 multiplied times 4.29. Uh, 2300 zero zero times 4.29 is equal to 9867. Add it in, plus the 15015 is equal to 20, whoops, 24882 minus 54450 is equal to 29568. Now, we could keep going. Can you tell me, if you add up the hours, do they add up to 8,400? OK, that never happens. I've made that happen, but that never happens. In the last year, generally, you have to do an adjustment because the number of actual usage never equals the estimate. Now, I've made it equal in this question, but that is a false equal does not happen. You cannot guess that you're going to drive a car for, you know, 80,000 kilometers over the life that you're going to use it and you actually drive 80,000 kilometers. So be aware, in the last period, you generally have to make an adjustment. We've got 2018 here. Then, of course, there would be December 31st, 2019, and December 31st, 2000 and, oh, 2020, and if we did all of that with the 2,000 hours here and the 600 hours here, because it works perfectly, sitting here would be the 18,450, the residual value. Would it be uh, April 30th? You're right. My apologies. You are correct. It would be April 30th, not 31st. 2020. All right, I'm not going to do this calculation, but because it works perfectly, just remember, generally in this, and I'm going to highlight this just so we can, we know for sure, generally in this year, this never actually equals 600. Can you give quick example of the adjustment that would be needed to be made in the last year? So let's assume, let's assume that in the last year, Let's assume that in the last year, it's 900, right? So if we took the 900, wait, now I'm going to have to do the previous year. 2,000 times 4.29 is equal to 8,5, oh, 8,0, darn it. One moment. Um, then we're going to add it in, and that's going to be plus 24882. I hope somebody's helping me by checking my numbers. I'm always a little stressed that my numbers aren't working out properly. 2988. Now, if we took the 900 
and we multiply the 900 times the 4.29, we would get 3,861. If we then added it in here, plus the 33,462, that would equal 37. 323. And as soon as we see that, we know minus 54, 450, that is equal to 17, 127. Well, now we see in that period, as soon as we know that it's not equal and we've gone below the residual value, we would do the exact same thing we did before. We would work backwards and we would say, no, I'm not going to use this information. Instead, I know that I need 18, 450 here. To get 18,450, I need 36,000 here. To get 36,000 here, I need to take the depreciation of, of, uh, of only, wait one second, I need to take depreciation of 2538. All right, is that clear, Andrew? OK, no problem. All right, so we have seen all three methods. Which method results in the highest depreciation expense over the life of the asset? Why do you say that, Philip? OK, prove it to me. Exactly. They all depreciate until we only have $18,450 left, which means we have accumulated depreciation in each of these examples, Philip, as $36,000. Absolutely. There is no difference between these depreciation methods. All that happens is the depreciation method, the different methods, move value from the statement of financial position over to the income statement at different rates, but they all move over the same amount. So the depreciation methods over the life of the asset make no difference. Annually, the depreciation methods make a difference. But over the life of the asset, it makes absolutely no difference at all. Perfect. So the choice really is trying to get the best matching of the expense to the revenue it helped to generate. All right. So let's move on now to disposal. So assume that on November 1st, 2018, the company sells the equipment for $30,000. What would the company record if they were using the following method of depreciation? Straight line. So let's go back to straight line. I've given you space on the page, you'll notice. So we're back at the straight line. And we're assuming that on November 1st, so I'm going to change the color of my pen so that we can see this very, very clearly. And I'm going to put that we sell it on November 1st, 2018. So none of this stuff would exist anymore, right? Because we're selling it, so it's gone. So November 1st, how many months would we use it? I just want to put that in a circle here. 11, no. 10. November 1st is November 1st. It's not for the whole month of November. So we're actually only using it for 10 months all the way to the end of October. Oh, no, I'm, I'm glad you did that, Philip, because the number of people who do that on the final exam, terrible. All right. So now, how much depreciation are we going to take? You've got the formula here. Somebody give it to me. 7,500. So we're going to take our depreciation of 15,000. We're going to add, so that's 22,500. Wait, I'm going to double check that number. 22,500. What is our um, carrying value? I get 31,930. So I hope you guys can confirm that that's the case. I'm just waiting for some. Wouldn't it be 50? Ooh, 50, it is 50. I don't know why I said 30. It's even in my calculator as a 50. All right, good. Now, how much are we selling it for? $30,000. So. Will we have a loss or a gain? A loss. Because our value is 31950 And we are only selling it for 30000 So therefore, we would have a loss. Let's do the entry that we would do at November 1st. There is always two entries. And inevitably, students forget one of the entries. So November 1st, when we sell it, there are two entries. The first entry is always the entry to bring the depreciation up to date 
from the beginning of the year to the date of sale. We calculated it as $7,500, and often students will calculate it, but then they don't do an entry for it. You have to do an entry for it, otherwise your accumulated depreciation is wrong when you do the disposal entry. So step one is to calculate and record depreciation up to the date of sale. So that would be a debit to depreciation expense and a credit to accumulated depreciation, 7500 Now. Also, step two on November 1st is to get rid of the equipment because you no longer own it. That means you're going to do first, recognize cash. Second, get rid of the accumulated depreciation. Accumulated depreciation is a credit account, so in order to get rid of it, we've got to debit it. How much accrued, oh, cash is $30,000, my apologies. How much accumulated depreciation should I put in here? Exactly, 22500 In fact, the accumulated depreciation is given on the chart. It's right here. So it's staring at us in the face. Now, I also have to get rid of the equipment. Equipment is a debit account, so I'm going to put a credit against it. That's credit equipment. What's the value of the equipment? Looking at the chart, what's the value of the equipment? I am so happy you said that, Mark. That is not the value of the equipment. Yes. So this is the next error that students make all the time. They put down this value, but this is a carrying value. It's a calculated number, original cost minus accumulated depreciation. We just got rid of accumulated depreciation. We have to get rid of the original cost, and the original cost is $54,000. But one of the most common errors I see is the use of the carrying value instead of the original value. Then the difference is either a loss or a gain, and we already know that it's going to be a loss. We know that because of this chart, 31950 We're going to have a loss of 1950 So that's a debit to a loss on sale, 1950 Questions about disposal? Remember there are two entries because you're going to lose at least three marks if you don't do the first entry. Second entry is sometimes worth as much as nine. Yes, it's the original. Oh, oh my goodness, fifty-four thousand four hundred and fifty. Fifty-four thousand four hundred and fifty. Thank you, Chelsea. All right. So, we're clear on this. We have a good feeling about this. Thumbs up. All right, good. Because now I'm going to ask you guys to do it. So here we are. We're at diminishing balance. I'm going to change the color of my pen again. We are getting rid of it on November 1st, 2018. Oh, yep, 2018. We've got a carrying value of 18, 450. What's the amount of my depreciation? Exactly. The amount of my depreciation is nothing. It's zero. Uh, remember that the 17 belongs to 2017. It's zero, right? My residual, sorry, my, my um, accumulated depreciation is 36,000, and my carrying value is 18,450. Loss or a gain? A major gain, right? Because we're selling it for 30,000 and it's sitting on our books for 18,450. So in that case, we can do the entry. November 1st, the first entry is no entry because it's already fully depreciated. The second entry on November 1st is going to be to get rid of it, debit cash. How much? $30,000. We're also going to debit the accumulated depreciation. Again, the accumulated depreciation is staring at us from the chart, 36000 So we've got 36000 We've got a credit to the equipment for the 54450 And then we're going to have a credit to the gain on sale. And that amount is going to be 30000 minus the 18450 which is equal to $11,550. Any questions or we can move on? Now we're at the units of activity. We need to know how many units were in this current year. 
if you look at it, it says under units of activity, used 1,900 machine hours. So we've got November 1st, 2018. We've got 1,900. Now, I leave this to you. I want to know if there is a gain or a loss and by what amount. You should be able to do the entry. So I'm going to pause for three minutes and go. Philip, you've got a loss of 1,284. Does everybody agree? I'm just going to give, give everyone a chance to catch up. Lauren, thank you. Michaela, thank you. Mark, excellent. Polly, excellent. OK, so I'm just going to add that here. I've got this multiplied times 4.29. This is going to be equal to 8151. I'm going to take this, add it in. That will equal 23,166. And that will make the carrying value 31,284. In that case, we can now do the entry. First entry, of course, at November 1st will be the debit to the depreciation expense, an entry that we do not want to forget during the exam, credit to accumulated depreciation, and it's going to be 8151, 8151. Then the second entry on November 1st is the actual disposal. So that's going to be a debit to cash for $30,000 a debit to the accumulated depreciation at 23166 a credit to the equipment at its original value of 54450 and then we said there was going to be a loss, a debit to the loss on sale of, a, what did we say, it was 1284. Excellent. So which method results in the highest depreciation expense over the life of the asset now that you're selling it early? Thoughts on this? Diminishing balance, because we've got a huge gain, right? 11,000, everybody agree? OK, so we agree it's diminishing balance. And of course now, I'm going to prove you wrong. All right, let's look at this. Here we go. We have accumulated depreciation of 23166 Do you see that little chart on your paper? I want you to start writing in the, the depreciation expense total, which is the accumulated depreciation. So under units of production, and, and I'm going to duplicate it here. Wait one second. Here we go. I'm going to duplicate it. Uh, I've got a yellow. Wait, wait, wait. I'm going to write. We've got units of production. We've got total depreciation expense of 23166 uh, But we also have a loss on sale, which is also a debit. This is a debit. These are all debits to the income statement. This is going to be a debit because it's a loss. One, two, eight, four. If we add those two numbers together, what do we get? Four and 10. And that's 6, 7, uh, 15. Then we got 2, 4, what, 3, 4. Do you get 24,450? OK, good. So now we're going to go back. Mm -hmm. So this is what we got here. And we, we also put in, I'm going to change my color. We also put in the loss because they're both debits, right? All right, so now we're going back to, here it is. Uh, this one, we have accumulated depreciation of 36000 but we have a gain on sale of 11550 This is a debit, right? But this is a credit. I, when I say debit, I mean all the depreciation entries were debits, but the gain is a credit. So if I go back to the last sheet, so now, diminishing balance, I've got the depreciation expense of six. 36,000, which is a debit, but I have a credit of that gain. Was the gain 11,000, what did we say it was? 11,000 and what? 11,550. So if I add these debits and credits together, guess what amount it makes? 24,450. Shall we do straight line? Although you can probably guess exactly what happens here. So under straight line, we have the accumulated depreciation is 22,000, and we have a loss of 1,950. So let's just transfer that over to our chart also, which you can probably guess what's going to happen. Here we go. 
we got 22,500, we've got 1,950, and when we add it up, it is 24,450. So what does that tell you? It tells you that over the life of the asset, depreciation doesn't matter. Because no matter what we do, they will all end up in the same place. Yes, individually by year, it's different. Yes, the total depreciation expense when we sell it early is different. But if you take it in combination to the gain or the loss, the total is always the same. How else could we get this total? Well, if we take the original value, 54450 and we subtract the amount we sold it for, it's 24450 you got to admit, sometimes accounting is beautiful. Come on. Come on. I love accounting. <laughs> All right. So we can see why a whole bunch of analysts pay no attention to depreciation. Because depreciation, in the end, it's a number of things. Depreciation is a non-cash item. When we do a debit to depreciation expense and a credit to accumulated depreciation, it actually doesn't cause any cash to flow anywhere at all. Next, no matter what method you use, in the end, it will all come out to the same. Yes, it has differences on an annual basis, but over the life of the asset, all the methods end up in the exact same place. All right, excellent. So let's move on. If you look at Q9-2, what we're looking at now is we're looking at intangibles. Before we, actually, before we do this, I want to talk about intangible assets. Let's just talk about intangible assets for a minute. Intangible assets are legal rights. They can't be picked up, kicked, you know, thrown away or anything like that. Well, they can be thrown away. Uh, but they can't be picked up, kicked. They have no physical substance. They are a legal right which is enacted in law. Intangible assets can be one of two things. They can have a definite life. Definite life assets last only for a specific period of time. It may be a period that the management has chosen because that's the period of time over which it will actually generate revenue. But it has a definite life. When you have a definite life intangible asset, you have to, de you have to depreciate. But we don't call it depreciation under IFRS. We call it amortization. So we have to amortize it, which is exactly the same, by the way, as depreciation. We can use any method we want as long as we are matching the expense to the revenue that it helps to generate. Now, inevitably, the method chosen is straight line. But that's not required. It's just that generally, intangible assets tend to consistently generate revenue. So for instance, the brand name, oh no, that's not a good idea, a patent, a patent that you have for 20 years may consistently generate revenue over those 20 years. So straight line is the only method I've ever seen, even though we are allowed to use other methods. It's just that I've never seen anybody use another method because you try to match the expense to the revenue it helps to generate. The residual value is always equal to zero. Why? Why is the residual value always equal to zero? It's because there's no active secondary market. Remember I said, in order to have a residual value, you must have an active secondary market. Even if my patent is for 20 years, and I decide to sell it in 10 years' time, because I think it'll diminish the amount that I'm, I'm uh, making, I still have to put my residual value at zero, because there's no active secondary market that allows me to determine what the residual value would be at the end of its useful life. So. Keep in mind that you need that active secondary market, or you can't have residual value. Now, because a definite life asset is amortized using straight line with zero residual value, we actually know how to do this. I mean, I need to show you how to amortize when you've already done depreciation using straight line. So what are definitive life or, or, or definite life assets? What are some of the items that would go under here? A patent, which has a legal life of 20 years, 
but could have an estimated useful life that's significantly less than that. A copyright. Copyright's legal life is the life of the creator plus 50 years. And that's why you see the Mona Lisa used in advertising, because the life of the creator plus 50 years has already gone by, so there's no longer a copyright on it, and anyone can use it. That's why I could take uh, photocopies and spread them around on the internet of any book where the author died more than 50 years ago, because it no longer has, it no longer falls under copyright law. A license. So a license, for instance, to sell drugs. So we might have a license that allows us to sell Parkinson's drugs here in Canada for the next 15 years. So I paid for that license. It's an intangible asset, a legal right, and I would amortize it over the life of the asset. These are all definite life assets, and they have to be amortized. And they are amortized exactly the same as we would amortize a piece of equipment using straight line, zero residual value. You also have an indefinite. An indefinite life asset is one that never ends. So an example of this is a trademark or a brand name. These have value going forward forever. I mean, everybody's got to recognize this. What is that? Exactly. I mean, I, we know what this is. I just did a check mark on the board, and we know what it is. You can see that this has value. What's this? Exactly. We don't even see it as an M anymore. We see it as McDonald's. That's a trademark. And you'll notice with these trademarks, there's a little bar with a circle around it. That's a registered trademark of McDonald's and a registered trademark of Nike. No one else can use that. What's this one? Ooh, I think I've got you stumped. Nobody recognizes that? Exactly. Thank you, Teresa. It's Toys R Us. Toys R Us copy or t patented, no, copyrighted, uh, no, 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 trademarked. Ugh. They trademarked the backwards R. No one can use it. I know they're going out of business, but I bet you they're going to sell it because other people have tried to use it and Toys R Us has sued them. So these are all things that are going to last forever. So we cannot amortize it because it's always got future economic benefit. So assets are equal to their future economic benefit and trademarks have an indefinite life benefit. So they are never, never, never amortized. Instead, we check them for impairment. Checking for impairment we, means we check to see that they still have future economic benefit. If they do not have future economic benefit up to the point where we think they should, then we're going to write it down. But an, a, a trademark would only be impaired if the company was having financial difficulty and no one wanted to buy their trademark. Trust me, someone's going to buy the backwards R from Toys R Us. All right, so those are the only two, two um, intangible assets. I'm not going to do the depreciation for a regular depreciation for this intangible asset, but we are going to do 9-2. You'll notice in 9-2 it says, Green Corporation does research in 2016 for a new process, spending $17,800 on research and $22,500 on development. There are very strict rules with regards to research and development. The only time we're allowed to capitalize, which means to recognize as an asset, um, anything that we spend is when we know that the product is a viable product and that it has a ready market for it. We also have to be financially secure to be able to finish it. There are actually six criteria that we have to meet in order to capitalize research costs. Research costs are, are researching things. We are not allowed to capitalize it. Development costs are allowed to be capitalized, but only if they meet the six criteria. So here we've got, in 2016, they spent $17,800 on research. The entry we're going to do when we have that is research expense. $17,800. And credit, cash. $17,800. So notice, research does not have a, a known market. It, 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 does, it is not as yet a viable product. 
Um, we don't know if it's going to go anywhere. It doesn't meet the six criteria, so it must be expensed. But in 2016, if the development costs meet the six criteria, and by the way, you do not have to know the six criteria. You just need to know that criteria must be met under both IFRS and ASPE. Then we would be able to capitalize it, and we would do something like development costs. But this is an asset account not an account, expense account, it's an asset account, it has future economic benefit, $22,500, and we would credit cash, $22,500. Then it says on October 1st, 2016, they register a patent for $8,000. So wait a minute, and on, on October 1st, 2016, our development costs have now been leveraged into a patent. So the first thing I have to do is I have to recognize that the development costs are now patent costs. So I'm going to move them out of development costs, which was a holding asset account, into patent, which is an asset account. So first I move the 22500 22500 into the patent account. Then I've got to recognize that I spent more on the patent so into the patent account also goes the registration fee. So if you look at my patent account, it would start with the, well, it would start with zero. Then I would put the 22,500 in, and then I would put the 8,000 in. So my total patent is $30,500. It's a patent, so it has a definite life. How long is its definite life? It says it will be depreciated using straight line over 10 years. Well, it's 10 years because even though a patent would be 20 years long, we don't think we can earn revenue on it after for the first 10 years. Probably a new technology will come out, something bigger and better will come out, so we believe we can only make money for 10 years. So notice we don't always depreciate over the legal life of 20 years. We have to assess how long it will generate revenue for us. So now, we're at December 31st, 2016. What entry do I have to make? Exactly, but remember that for, for intangibles, we don't call it depreciation. We call it amortization. Okay, so I've got a debit to the amortization expense and a credit to accumulated amortization, exactly like the accumulated depreciation. What will be the amount? 3050 I don't think so, Andrew. When was it ready for use? Exactly. 762 it's actually 762.50, but depreciation and amortization, we round. So, 760, I'm going to change it to 763 because I think it's 50 cents. So does everybody understand why it's 763 slash 2? Okay, excellent. So now, it says here, okay, we're going to go to a new page. And we're going to continue with this example. So don't forget, right now, sitting in the patent account, we have three zero. 500, zero, zero, and sitting in the accumulated amortization, we've got 763. All right. Then it says on June 1st, 2017, they spend 19,000 defending their patent in court, winning their case. When you defend the patent and you win, you may add it to the cost of the intangible asset because you have spent money in order to protect it. So you're permitted to capitalize 100% of legal costs as long as you win. So in that case, on June 1st, I'm going to do an, an entry of debit patent, $19,000, and credit cash, $19,000. Now I'm at December 31st, 2017. What's the amount of the entry that I have to do? 4,125? Let's see if you're correct, Andrew. All right, so I'm going to take the 30,500 and I'm going to 
amortize that, divide it by 10. And so for the year, that would be 3050. Then I would take the 19,000 and I would divide it not by 10. I, in fact, I always change it into the number of months. So I would take um, 10, multiply it times 12, and then I have to subtract all the months that the patent has existed before I spent the $19,000. So you got to think that in the first year, I had it for three months, so I'm going to subtract the three months. And in this year, I used it for five months. So let's calculate that amount. We've got $19,000 divided by 24, wait, 24 minus 3 minus 5, which is equal to 16. So 19,000 divided by 16 is equal to so that, I'm just going to write down 19,000 divided by, wait, I don't think it's 16. I got that wrong. 12 times 120 minus 3 minus 5, it's equal to 112 months. And then, when I calculate that amount, 19 divided by 112, it's equal to 169.64. That's per month. Now, for 2017, I can take the 169.64 and I can multiply it times, how many months was it? It was seven months, and that is equal to 1187.48. So I'm going to make it 1187. 1187 plus 3050 is equal to 4237. This would be amortization expense, 4237, and accumulated amortization. Andrew, how, many, how did you come up with your number? Please don't tell me you took 30,500, added in the 19,000, and divided by 10. Did you? I'm checking. I can't do that. Can't do that because the 19,000, and I'm going to change colors just so I can make this really clear. The 19,000 will have value only for the remaining life, leftover life. That's why I calculated in months 112. The 30,000. 500 is still going to be good for the 10 years. So I can divide that by 10 years, and it's going to be correct. But the 19,000, whenever you add in more value, you must amortize it over the remaining useful life. So you have to take away the life you've already used on the asset. All right, so here's my question. On December 31st, 2018, what will be the amount of the amortization? because we're still going to do the same account names, but I want to know what will be the amount of the amortization. Exactly. 5086, which will be the 3050 plus 169.64 times 12. 5085.68, which we round up to 5086. Uh, where did the... Oh. Because the original useful life was 10 years, and I find it very confusing to, to work in years when there's partial years. It comes up with a whole bunch of weird percentages. So I change this into months. And then I deduct the previous months taken. And I find that's a lot easier to deal with than trying to use years. Yes. Uh, months amortized in the past. Absolutely. All right, are we good to move on to our last question? Excellent. Okay, so Q9-3. What is goodwill? So goodwill is when a company purchases another company for 
more than it's worth. Now, I'm not talking about a bargain purchase. I'm talking, you know, you go out, you purchase another company, and you buy it for a lot more than the fair value of its assets minus liabilities. That's called goodwill. And I want to do an example so you totally understand goodwill. Right here, I've got assume that green corporation, so we've got green corporation, they purchase blue corporation. The fair value of blue's assets are equal to $2 million. Fair value meaning that we've got an appraiser in and they tell us this is what you could sell all your assets for. The fair value of their liabilities is equal to $1 million. So looking at this, what should you pay? You should pay $1 million for this company because the assets minus the liabilities are equal to $1 million. Why do companies pay more than a million dollars? Because this company paid nine million dollars. Why would a company pay nine million dollars for another company when their assets minus their liabilities at the price you could sell them at on the open market today is only a million? Why would you pay nine? Future benefit. Define that for me. What does that mean? The profit you think you can make in the future, if they have tech or a brand that will help your company, if it's a vertical integration, there are so many reasons why companies will pay. It, you know, it might be a brand that you really, really want and you think you can expand on, or it might be an avenue to make more uh, revenue. For instance, when, um, when YouTube buys another company, that's right. Exactly. So the whole thing is I'm willing to pay $9 million for this $1 million net, net value of this company is $1 million. I'm willing to pay $9 million because I believe that the, the thing that I'm buying, and, and the thing I'm buying is really intangible, right? I mean, you can't touch or feel a brand. You cannot say, oh, I can point to the profit in the future and I know I'm going to make that profit. You cannot say those things. Really, you are paying $9 million, so Green forked out $9 million for what? They, they forked out $9 million for a dream. That's what it is. Whenever one company buys another company for way more money, they are, they are betting on a dream. So how would Green Corporation, we're not going to look at how Blue Corporation would record this because Blue Corporation would disappear after this. They would get rid of all their assets and all their liabilities and then they would distribute the money to their shareholders and that would be the end of Blue Corporation. How does Green account for this? Well, they would have to credit, sorry, they would have to debit the, all the individual assets. So if there was cash and equipment and all the rest of it, rest of it, they would have to debit their assets for $2 million. They would also have to credit all the liabilities for $1 million because that's what they took over. They would also have to credit cash for $9 million because that's what they paid. What's wrong with this entry? It doesn't balance. The debit is to goodwill. And the debit is for $8 million. So goodwill is a dream. That's all it is. This example is a real company. This actually is Draxis Health. Draxis Health purchased Spectroderm, which is a, a dermatological um, a face wash uh, that is highly recommended by dermatologists in Canada. And so they bought it. They bought this $1 million company. I know because I was working for it, so I was involved in this. They bought it for $9 million. And so we had goodwill of $8 million on our books. And as the story goes in this question, unfortunately, the expansion does not go well. And the expansion did not go well. I've I'd fudge the dates and all these numbers are rounded. But this is exactly what happened. Um, two years later, the expansion into the United States went terribly. And we pulled all the products from the United States because we were spending millions. We were spending more millions trying to get it into the US market. And it was an absolute flop. So after it flopped, we assessed goodwill at zero. So you got to think, we're sitting here with goodwill on our books of $8 million. This is an asset, a, an esoteric dream asset. 
and suddenly we say to ourselves, you know what, this did not go well and we don't think we're going to generate revenue going into the United States, which was the purpose of us buying Spectroderm. And so it went down to zero. So what do we have to do? Well, we have to credit Goodwill for $8 million. It's great that you're going to credit Goodwill for $8 million. What's your debt at? What do you think I'm going to debt it? Nope, because this isn't a debt. Impairment, it's a goodwill write-off. Eight million. And that's what companies do. If you look at financial statements from companies, sometimes when they announce the results, they'll announce that the earnings per share was lower because of a goodwill write-off. That's exactly what's happened. The company has looked at the the... Okay, so Green Corporation has looked at what they bought Blue Corporation as and said, yeah, there's, there's no dream anymore. The dream is gone, and we have to recognize that that dream does not have future economic benefit. And so here's my dream, and here is my nightmare. Any questions about Goodwill? It is an asset account. Goodwill here is an asset account, but the write-off is totally a loss account on the, on the income statement. Loss account on the income statement, you're going to take a hit to your, to your uh, net income or your profitability, and it's going to decline for that year at least. Sometimes a write-off of goodwill has been as much as uh, the largest I've ever seen was just over $30 million written off because what they dreamed of did not come true. Thank you very much for joining me. Have a great evening.